My name is Rabbi Rami Shapiro. I'm the author of a new book called Judaism Without Tribalism, a guide to being a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Let's talk about the difference between tribe and tribalism. Judaism is a tribal religion. I'm a member of the Jewish tribe. I am excited about being a member of the Jewish tribe. A tribe has its own literature, its own cuisine, its own dress, its own language. The Jewish tribe is multilingual, it's multi-ethnic, it's multiracial. It has a vast liturgy, a, a literature that goes back thousands and thousands of years and is no less vibrant today than it was. Being a tribe is not a problem. Tribalism is a problem. Tribalism is when your tribe is the superior tribe over all other tribes, where your understanding is the only legitimate understanding. And this can happen between religions, and it can happen within religions. So just as an example, we are taping this on July 21st. On June 30th, less than a month ago, there were two bar mitzvah services and one bat mitzvah service at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. They were in the egalitarian section, which is set aside for more liberal oriented Jews to have a meaningful experience at the wall. And all three services were attacked by very orthodox Jews. They, they tried to disrupt the service because they felt it was against Judaism. Their way was the only way. They grabbed prayer books, they grabbed Sidurim containing the holy name of God, which they claimed to revere, and they tore them up. Now, I know this from reading accounts in the paper, but I also know a cantor who was there because, one, because the bat mitzvah girl was her granddaughter. So I have a firsthand knowledge of this, or I guess that secondhand knowledge, as well as you know, from the newspaper. This is tribalism. This is madness. Judaism without tribalism highlights the best of Judaism, not the worst. Some people who at least claim to have read the book are upset by this notion that somehow I'm stripping Judaism of its uniqueness. I'm trying to make it sort of a, a Unitarian or Universalist, not Unitarian, but Universalist kind of thing that has no tom, no taste. That's the farthest thing from my mind and from what this book does. This book celebrates the holidays. It celebrates Shabbat. It celebrates Kashrut. In a way, though, that invites the non-Orthodox person to engage with these things in a way that speaks to them more, maybe more personally. So for example, when, when we deal with the holidays, I approach the holidays not halachically. I'm not saying this is what you have to do. There's lots of books about that. I look at each holiday and I ask questions, not about the holiday, but questions about reality that the holiday addresses. For one example, Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of the universe. It's also said to be the birthday of humanity. And so the question that I ask uh, that I think Rosh Hashanah deals with or poses to the practitioner, to the Jew, the question is, what's the meaning of life? Who are you as a human being? Torah gives us a number of responses to this, but Genesis gives us two. Genesis 1 tells us that we are here to dominate nature to rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all, of, all the creepy crawly walking things on the planet. Genesis 2 tells us a very different story. It tells us that we are from the earth. The Bible is clear. Torah makes it clear. It's Adam, the human, from Adama, the earth. We are from the earth, and we're here to serve the earth. In Genesis 1, the earth is flourishing, and there's no real need for people. So people are created last as an, almost as an afterthought, and they have nothing to do. So God makes them the managers of a planet that is doing quite well without us. But in Genesis 2, and you can see my bias, I like Genesis 2 better, the earth is barren. Nothing is growing. 
because two elements are missing. One is water, and God causes springs to, to come up from the ground. And the other is a, a gardener, a caretaker, humans. And so God takes from the earth and shapes the human being, the Adam, and places the Adam you know, in the garden to, it says, protect and serve, to work the garden. And the great thing about the text is the word that is said to serve the garden, to work the garden, is the same word. It's avodah. It's the same word we use when we talk about worship. Somehow, when we fulfill our role as servants of nature, it is a worship. It's an act of worship. It is a divine, an act of divine service. This does not denude Judaism at all. This highlights what I think is the best of Judaism. And I am positive that there are hundreds of thousands of Jews out there who never heard this, who only know Judaism as a vague halachic system that does not speak to them at all. One woman just wrote to me today and said, Judaism has no juice for her. And so she follows a Catholic mystical tradition. I want to bring the juice back for those who feel Judaism has no juice not by changing the tradition, but by highlighting the parts of it that I think are the most vibrant. One of the questions that comes up with people who have read the book is, why does Judaism still matter? I mean, it's a 4,000 year old tradition. Hasn't it sort of said what it has to say and done what it has to do? And it's really, maybe it's finished. I don't believe that at all. Judaism is ever vibrant because Jews continue to reinvent it and keep it vibrant. What does Judaism have to offer the world? I was invited years ago, I was invited to India. Uh, it was an anniversary of Swami Vivekananda's 150th birthday. And he was a major, major Hindu Swami, Hindu saint. And teachers from all around the world, from all different traditions were invited. And we were invited to answer a question that Swami put to the world's religions in the late 1800s, when he was at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago. And his question was, what do you bring to the table? And so I was invited to come to New Delhi and to speak to what Judaism brings to the table of you know, planetary wisdom. Now there's so many things you could say, but the thing that spoke to me the most was our pedagogy, the way we learn. It's unique, as far as I know, among the world's religions. Our pedagogy is defined as, this is from the, the Talmud, the phrase is Elu Elu divrei Elohim chayim, which means literally, because these and these are the words of the living God. But the idea is your opinion and my opinion, even though they are drastically opposed to one another, are both the words of the living God. In other words, are both true, even though they don't jive, they're both true if our argument is machlochet l'shem shemayim, an argument for the sake of heaven, an argument for the sake of spiritual truth. If you and I are sincere in our exploration of Jewish history and Jewish text and Jewish teaching, and we come to very different conclusions about what these things mean or how they ought to be lived, it's not in, in the Jewish world, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's that both are right if the intent is to make Judaism all the more rich and to help people who follow Judaism become rooted more and more deeply in truth with a capital T. Tribalism, and again, the book is called Judaism Without Tribalism, tribalism rejects our ancient pedagogy of Elu Elu that accepts all the different opinions. It rejects that and says, no, we have one opinion and it's our opinion and no other opinion counts. That is the death knell of Judaism. Judaism thrives by argument and discussion and disagreement. We are not monolithic. We are vibrant and always challenging our own positions. This attitude of elu elu, allowing for discordant views to be held at the same time, this attitude is, I think, unique to Judaism. And maybe the main thing that Judaism brings to the world community, everyone has similar ethics, but only Jews have 
a civilization, this is from Amos Oz, the, the Israeli author, he defines Judaism as a civilization of argument and doubt. And that is brilliant. When I gave that talk about Elu Elu and argument and doubt and how we challenge one another, when I gave that talk in India, when it was over and there was a break, I was swamped by swamis who came to me and said, how can we do that in our traditions? And of course, I had no idea. You have to talk to the guru. But what they said was, look, our guru tells us what the text means. And we don't challenge that. But in Judaism, we do. And it's that capacity to challenge, that fervor to see what else the text can reveal and not be dumbed down to a single reading or a single understanding or a single way of practice. That dynamism, modeling that dynamism is what the world needs. Some of the pushback that this book is generating, and I'm really happy that it is, is an upset around the fact that I included a chapter in the book on Jesus. Why, in a Jewish book, would you bring in Jesus? My attitude is, you have to. In a book that's trying to highlight the genius of Judaism to, to I don't know, exile the most famous Jew you know, in the world, would, would be a real mistake. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher of Torah. I mean, you get that just from the Gospels themselves. When Jesus is asked, what's the most important commandment? He quotes from Deuteronomy, and then he follows it up with a quote from Leviticus. Jesus is a Jew. Somehow, and there's a whole history as to how, somehow we lost him. That the Christians, you know, that we talk about appropriating other cultures, the early Christians appropriated this rabbi from us. They took a guy who for us was a wise teacher and they turned him into a god, right? He, they, don't, they don't worship Jesus, they were Christians, they worship Christ. That's why they're called Christians and not Jesus is Jesus. Is, I don't know what you're going to actually say it, but they, they're Christians because they worship Christ. The chapter I wrote has nothing to do with Christ. The chapter I wrote is about how to reclaim Jesus and read him through Jewish eyes and to understand what he's saying in a way that, of course, this is very biased on my part, maybe even tribalist, though I hope not, to reclaim him by putting what he says back into the Jewish context in which he said it. And when we do that, Jesus becomes a God-intoxicated Jewish mystic. He's not a rebellious guy. He's not a, an anti-Jewish guy. He has arguments with some of his fellow you know, Pharisees. He has arguments with other, other Jews. But his main argument is with the occupying Roman army. His main argument is that Judaism is being suppressed. And his main argument is that it's losing because its leaders, perhaps I'm not saying this, but maybe he might have been saying this, that its leaders have been co-opted by the politics of their time. And so he's bringing out what he considers to be the main wisdom teachings of Judaism. He's not interested in anything other than Judaism. And he says that overtly. So what I did in this chapter is in, uh, hopefully at least introduce the reader to the Jewish Jesus and then encourage uh, Jews to own him and to not allow, and, and again, this is maybe controversial, but to not allow Jesus to become a, a mirror of Christian fantasy. <laughs> that, that's really sort of harsh perhaps, but not allow the Christians to tell you who Jesus was. They can tell you who the Christ is because they're Christians, but only we know who Jesus was because he's a Jew and so are we. When I think about what the reader can get from this book, I mean, I have a reader in mind. I wrote it for people who were struggling to understand what Judaism might be. There's lots of books that tell you what Judaism is. But I was trying to look at what could it be? If we go back to the core teachings, 
if we take Hillel seriously and say the entire Torah is wrapped up in the phrase, what is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. If we go back to the teaching of Rabbi Abaye in the Talmud in the fourth century, who said that there are always 36 people alive on the planet who are in touch with the divine spirit and acting out in a holy manner by being a blessing to all the families of the earth or all the peoples of the earth. When we take these things seriously, how does Judaism, what does it Judaism look like when you take those things seriously? What I want the reader to get is that Judaism is exciting, that Judaism is powerful, that Judaism speaks to all times, but certainly to our time, our time, which is so trapped in tribalism and in fascism and in violence and in fear and hatred, and all these things that are happening in religions, to religions, and to all of us on the planet, that Judaism, at least as I'm presenting it in the book, is an antidote to all of that. So if you're a Jew who's reading the book, I want to kindle a newfound pride in being a Jew. But more than that, because pride is just a feeling, I want to kindle action. I want you to, to look at the book and say, well, wait, maybe Shabbat is an antidote to my being overly driven by consumer capitalism. And maybe I can look at Shabbat as a way to resist that and to free myself from that at least one day a week. Of course, I'm not telling you how to do Shabbat in the book. There are other books that can do that. I'm just saying, here's a one day a week that maybe can liberate you from uh, what Eric Fromm calls the need to have and allow you to celebrate the reality of just being. He says you, you're either focused on having or being. Shabbat is a day for being. So I'm hoping the Jew looks at that and says, well, you know, I've never really tried this or I've gone to synagogue and it doesn't speak to me and I don't know Hebrew, and, but maybe I'll try looking at it from a different perspective and creating, looking at the resources of Shabbat and creating my own Sabbath. To non-Jewish readers, I hope what they hear or what they get from reading the book is an understanding that there is still a strong prophetic voice for human liberation in the world. Judaism doesn't have a monopoly, but Judaism is one of the voices that speaks truth to power and not one that can be easily dismissed. And so whether you're a Jewish uh, reader or a non-Jewish reader, the book just kindles an awareness of who the Jews are, what the Jews teach, and then maybe more importantly, how you can incorporate those things, those teachings, and some of the practices in your own way, in your own life. <laughs>